Hello all, uh, Bruce Robison here from All Saints Brighton Heights with my weekly Vickers video as we look ahead to Sunday, March 13th, uh, which is the second Sunday in Lent on the church calendar, year C in the three-year lectionary cycle. Uh, in my sermon last Sunday, I noted how our name for this church season, Lent, is uh, derived from the old English word Lenten, uh, the season of lengthening the spring uh, when the winter solstice is uh, in the rearview mirror and the uh, days are growing longer, lengthening, and the nights shorter, and as we head along towards summer. Uh, maybe it's a good time to remind everyone that this Sunday, March 13th, is the first day of daylight saving time. So before we go to bed on Saturday evening, March 12th, we want to advance our clocks an hour so that we uh, are up in time to uh, uh, get to church on Sunday morning. Uh, it's a jolting transition. I don't really like the transition from standard time to daylight time and then back from daylight time to standard time. Uh, but I do have to say I uh, very much enjoy the sunshine as it extends further and further into the evening. And uh, even if uh, the weatherman has given us a little bit of snow in this early March time, uh, I uh, uh, still am looking a lot forward to, to the season ahead. Uh, last week, I tried a little play on words, some of you will remember, uh, to say that if the meteorological season that we're entering now is all about the victory of the sun, speaking about the sunshine out the outdoors there. So on the calendar of the Christian year, uh, this season of Lent is about the victory of the sun, the S-U-N sun and the S-O-N sun. And uh, I commented that the disciplines that we take on during this season can be, uh, uh, for us, uh, symbols, I guess we would say, gestures uh, to show our loyalty uh, to the victorious sun. So uh, while we're certainly in this world entirely, we would not be conformed to this world, but pledge our allegiance now to our new king. Uh, passing on a dessert, uh, getting up a little early for morning Bible study, all of that to say that we no longer cling to those things that are passing away. Uh, but uh, we turn instead to the one who shall abide forever. Uh, so the idea of Lent as a time when our loyalty of, to Christ is renewed and refreshed really does seem front and center as we gather for worship this second Sunday in Lent. Uh, the collect of the day and the readings from Genesis and from Paul's uh, letter to the Philippians and from Luke chapter 13. Uh, the Collect of the Day uh, for this Sunday, it's new as a Sunday Collect in our 1979 prayer book, uh, but it's based on an ancient uh, prayer, an ancient intercession that actually occurs in the traditional series of Latin uh, solemn collects appointed specifically uh, for Good Friday. And uh, uh, it's specifically uh, intended to address a prayer for heretics, um, that is to say, those whose beliefs and teachings have departed from the biblical faith of the church, including both those who promote unorthodox doctrine and those who were once members of the Christian family, but who have now uh, declared themselves in one way or another to be unbelievers. So uh, we offer uh, our prayers for, for them in this season of Lent. Uh, we have the imagery of the shepherd's flock in the background as we pray for the lost sheep, uh, for those who have gone astray. Now, of course, we know that as the old hymn says, uh, we are all of us prone to wander. Uh, and in the season of Lent, as we pray for those who have departed from the company of the faithful, we make this prayer with humility. Uh, we recognize that our hope in the end will not be in the perfection of our discipleship, but rather in his glorious mercy, uh, the glorious mercy of our gracious God as shown forth in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we, as we gather for worship on this second Sunday in Lent, uh, we'll pray at the beginning of our service together. 
O God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways, and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word, Jesus Christ, your Son, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God forever and ever. So with that collect in the in the background, I think it's right to say that the, the readings from Scripture this week, all in one way or another, uh, uh, will, will address the the mercy of God as he seeks us when we are lost and as he brings us safely home. Uh, the Old Testament reading is from Genesis chapter 13, 15, and uh, it's one of the uh, central, actually the pivotal moments at the foundation of what we call salvation history, the, the covenantal relationship between God and our human family. Uh, this great chapter of the story begins with Abraham called Abram here, uh, and uh, Abram whom God chooses and God calls. Uh, Abram hears God, uh, but uh, he expresses his doubt that God can actually fulfill the promise uh, that he seems to be making. Uh, the promise that through Abram, God will share a blessing to all creation through Abram and through his posterity. Uh, Abraham doesn't see how that can happen at his age and uh, with the fact that he is uh, at this point childless. But, but God repeats his promise and uh, uh, overcomes Abram's doubt by making a solemn pledge. Uh, the ceremony that uh, we see in this reading uh, is actually an ancient custom of contract uh, signature. Uh, uh, it's uh, something that's found in other places in ancient Near Eastern texts. Uh, we, we all may remember as children, uh, we would say, cross my heart and hope to die. Or, or perhaps we remember uh, the stirring words that uh, come at the very end of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, you remember that, in which the signers of the Declaration say, and for the support of this Declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Uh, with this ceremony, this ceremony that uh, where these sacrificed animals are cut in two, and then uh, the person making the contract passes between the divided parts of their of their bodies. What what uh, this very strange. Uh, symbol of this very strange gesture means is something like, may what has happened to these animals happen to me if I fail to fulfill the promise I have just made. Um, you know, in, in most world religions, there are stories about people who make promises to their gods in return for some advantage or some benefit. Uh, it's so fascinating that here it's God who makes a promise and makes a pledge himself uh, to his people. He says to us, you can trust me and I pledge you my life that I will keep my word. It might seem an odd thing for God to say to his people, I pledge you my life that I will keep my word. But, but certainly here in the second week of Lent, uh, we look on ahead to Holy Week and Good Friday, the, the memory of the God who puts his very life on the line for us as a solemn pledge uh, certainly echoes with great power. So uh, this week, uh, a reading from Genesis chapter 15, read verses 1 through 12 and then 17 and 18. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what wilt thou give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, thou hast given me no offspring, and a slave born in my house will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir, your own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, 
so shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer, three years old, a she-goat, three years old, a ram, three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in two, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when birds of prey came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and lo, a dread and great darkness fell upon him. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, as a, as a response, following this uh, reading from Genesis uh, on Sunday morning, our congregation will share in the reading of Psalm 27, which I think is a kind of Abrahamic testimony of faith. We, we've heard that, that, uh, that Abraham had faith and that God counted uh, that faith as righteousness. Uh, and um, even when the night seems darkness, the, the psalmist says here in Psalm 27, even when our situation seems beyond hope, we can be confident in God's trustworthy character. Uh, God won't abandon us. Uh, he won't leave us wandering, lost in the wilderness. He won't leave us to be overcome by our enemy. Even at this moment, we wait patiently and confidently for him. Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom then shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom then shall I be afraid? When evildoers came upon me to eat up my flesh, it was they, my foes and my adversaries, who stumbled and fell. Though an army should encamp against me, yet my heart shall not be afraid. And though war should rise up against me, yet will I put my trust in him. One thing have I asked of the Lord, one thing I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the fair beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble he shall keep me safe in his shelter. He shall hide me in the secrecy of his dwelling and set me high upon a rock. Even now he lifts up my head above my enemies round about me. Therefore I will offer in his dwelling an oblation with sounds of great gladness. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hearken to my voice, O Lord, when I call. Have mercy on me and answer me. You speak in my heart and say, Seek my face. Your face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not your face from me, nor turn away your servant in displeasure. You have been my helper. Cast me not away. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. Though my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will sustain me. Show me your way, O Lord. Lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Deliver me not into the hand of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen up against me, and also those who speak malice. What if I had not believed that I should see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living? O oh, tarry and await the Lord's pleasure. Be strong, and he shall comfort your heart. Wait patiently for the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Well, our, our second reading uh, this week uh, from the third chapter of Philippians, I think actually picks up our theme very effectively. 
as Paul contrasts those outside the community of faith, those who have lost confidence in the promise of Christ, uh, even those who have become enemies of the cross of Christ, uh, those who have uh, aligned themselves with uh, uh, teachings that God hasn't in Christ fulfilled his cross my heart and hope to die moment, that he hasn't and won't gather his children into his saving arms of love. Paul's word to the Christians of Philippi is very much the same word as uh, the one that we have just heard at the conclusion of Psalm 27. Be strong and he shall comfort your heart. Wait patiently for the Lord. So a reading from Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 through chapter 4, verse 1. Brethren, join in imitating me and mark those who so live as you have an example in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is the belly and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our commonwealth is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will change our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power which enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brethren, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, Stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, uh, the gospel reading appointed for us this week uh, from Luke chapter 13 is this brief, but actually so tender, uh, so serious a moment. And in the first part of Luke chapter 13, before this, this week's uh, lectionary selection, uh, Jesus has been preaching through the towns and villages on his way toward Jerusalem, toward Holy Week, towards the cross, as the tide of rejection and opposition to him seems to be growing hour by hour. Many of those who had, had been followers of his before uh, now are turning aside, turning away from him. And uh, I think it's, it's uh, hard as we hear this, uh, as we read through this, this passage, uh, not to remember those words from the first chapter of John uh, that we heard uh, in our readings on the Sunday after Christmas Day. He came to his own, but his own received him not. Such a, a, a moment of sadness. In the, in the midst of enemies and hardened hearts, uh, Jesus continues to reach out, uh, continues to call uh, to his lost sheep to seek after them. Uh, it's a sort of shocking thing uh, to his disciples because uh, the expectation was that when the Messiah came, the chosen people would recognize him with joy. But, but that's not what is happening with Jesus. In fact, even many of those who had followed him before were now beginning to fall away, as I, as I said. Uh, uh, at verse 23, someone asked Jesus, uh, will uh, those who are saved be few? Now, we wonder about that ourselves. And his reply doesn't really answer that question, but he says, strive to enter by the narrow door. So will they be few? Well, enter by the narrow door. Uh, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. And, and he tells the parable of the householder. And when the hour comes and the, the sun is revealed, many of those who had been enemies Many of those who had been friends but who had departed would suddenly seek to enter. Uh, and he, those old friends would say, hey, we ate and drank in your presence. But the householder would reply, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. It's just too late for you now. If you, if you didn't stand firm, to use Paul's language, if you, you didn't wait patiently, if you, you turned away from him in the time of trial, uh, even if you misled others by encouraging them to follow in some other way, uh, then there would be real consequences and tragic consequences. Strive to enter by the narrow door. Stand firm. Wait patiently. Uh, how painful it is for Jesus to see this rejection. He, he sheds tears. He sheds real tears uh, over, over those who have turned away from him. And, 
And uh, certainly what he feels for Jerusalem in this pas passage, uh, using that city and what it is, was to come on Good Friday, it's kind of standing for, for all of us throughout all those uh, generations to come. Um, those who turn away from him, uh, those who often seek to follow an easier path, uh, those of us who don't rest confidently in his promise. Uh, this, this moment of, of grief for Jesus is a kind of anticipation of the, the pain he feels at the cross. So we hear uh, today, this second Sunday in Lent, the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Glory be to thee, O Lord. This is Luke chapter 13, verses 31 to 35. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killing the prophets and stoning those who are sent to you. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. And, and uh, so we go on into this, this Lent, uh, beginning now the second full week. Uh, just to say, if for, for any reason, uh, we may feel that we haven't really taken advantage of the opportunity that Lent provides us to, to partake of the, that spiritual refreshment that comes through a special emphasis on fasting, praying, and giving in this season, on the, the special nourishment that comes from reading scripture and uh, listening as we read to, to hear God's word for us. Uh, well, it's only the second uh, week of Lent. Uh, there's still plenty of time. And uh, this second week can be a fresh start for us, and that would be great. And uh, continue as we can with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit guiding us along the way. And uh, uh, continuing to pray as we do through this whole season, the Collect for Ash Wednesday. Almighty God, who hatest nothing that thou hast made, and dost forgive the sins of all them that are penitent, create and make in us new and contrite hearts, that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain of thee the God of all mercy, perfect remission, and forgiveness through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So blessings to you all. Have a, a great weekend, a great week ahead, and hope to see you in church on Sunday.